being a gangster isn't all fun and games all the time. There was a guy called Jimmy Rutkin, Jimmy Niggy Rutkin. I have no idea why he got that name. I have no idea. Uh, anyway, uh, he had once been briefly on top of the world. He was one of New Jersey and New York's more colorful bootleggers. He was over the top. He was a born gambler. He bet 50000 one time, lost it, didn't bet an eye. He earned his living as originally as muscle for New Jersey's criminal boss, Longy Zwillman. He eventually made his way up to, you know, sort of a partnership with Zwillman. Rupkin was also a major wheel in Zwillman's profitable, very profitable, raw alcohol distilling business uh, with a guy named Phil Cull, who had been a former Newark cop who was... <laughs> who was fired because he used, he was on duty when he did this. He used a newer patrol car to guard a, a liquor shipment for a guy, for a guy named Ben Zuckerman, a Prohibition guy. So before Prohibition, Joseph Renfield, who's now on the scene, arrives in New Jersey from Poland and he opened a tavern and then Prohibition hit. And he, by that time, had several taverns and he just, I can't get good quality liquor. What am I gonna do? He knew Zwillman or introduced to him, so he formed a sig syndicate, a, a liquor syndicate with Zwillman, Doc Starcher, and James Rutkin. Doc Starcher was all over the place in the late uh, 40s and 50s. They imported liquor from Canada, and they partnered with Samuel Bronfman of, of Joseph E. Seagram's and Sons Distilleries. So the liquor was transported from Canada to the island of St. Paris. Uh, a French territory near Newfoundland, Canada, and then shipped at night into, secretly into Port Newark in New Jersey. Testimony during the Kefauver hearings estimated that the Renfield Syndicate imported 40% of all the alcohol consumed in the U.S. during Prohibition. I should narrow that down, all the alcohol, meaning uh, they didn't sell beer. They were into hard liquors, whiskeys, and all that sort of thing. After Prohibition ended in 1933, Renfield founded Brown Vinters, it was a liquor import distribution company, as a legal continuation of the syndicate he had formed. The other guys fell off from the syndicate, they didn't stick with it. Uh, Brown Vinters, his company, became the importer and distributor for White Horse Scotch Whiskey, one of the big five uh, Scotch whiskeys. The company was sold to Seagram's in 1940 for about $7.5 million. Um, God knows how much that would be today. However, Reinfeld ran into problems because according to Zwillman and all these other guys, he shortchanged them. They felt that they should have been in on that when he sold the syndicate that they had built up. Rutkin wasn't going to hear about it. In 1943, he goes to Reinfeld's house. He pulls out a pistol, puts it to Reinfeld's forehead, and he says, I need 250000 in cash. I'm not going to play with you. So Reinfeld gave him the 250000 but then he reported the payment on his taxes. So I bribed this guy to him. I was extorted here. Uh, the problem was the IRS was on the ball and they noticed that Ruckin didn't file anything to do with the 250000 And they got him a, a tax evasion charge in 1950. According to Ruckin, until the day he died, that money was, he only got a portion of it. He distributed the rest between Zwillman, all these Doc Starcher, all these other guys. But the government didn't want to hear about that. They said, if you, if you can't prove it, you know, of course he didn't get a receipt. So he's in a lot of trouble. So Ruckin allegedly now paid for his criminal defense by selling narcotics in a partnership with Charles Haber, who was also known as Charles Haberman. Haber had been also one of the original members of the Reinfeld as well in Beer Syndicate. So in 1956, at age 57, uh, he's uh, prison, he's sentenced to four years in prison and given a $10,000 fine. So it's ruckiness. So in the mid-trial, he decides to just stop. He's going to fight him, and he realizes he stops. He says to the judge in the middle of the trial, I give up. You got me. I'm throwing in the towel. So... During the trial, he was, Ruckin was also called into the Kefauver Committee, and he was pissed. And he stood before the senators, and he said, what the hell do you guys want with me? I'm small peanuts. I don't know nothing. Why don't these Hollywood investigators you hire go and get Jerry Hoover up here? He'll tell them everything they want to know in two days. Well, that didn't go over well with the committee. So Ruckin was sent, he's going to prison for four years. He's sent to the Hudson County Jail in Jersey City, where then he's going to be transferred up to Danbury Federal Prison. 
he was not in good shape. He was ridden with ulcers. He had a string of operations to do something. That none of the operations were helping him. Uh, he was broke. Uh, and he's going to jail until he hits 61, 62 years old. He went to the jail infirmary and he asked the fellow there, he said, could I have a razor? And we, his words, to spruce up for the trip to Danbury. So they gave him a razor, razor blade, in other words. And he stepped into a shower stall and he cut his throat and he bled to death before anybody could do anything to help him. Three years later, Rutkin's former boss, business partner, Longley Zillman, went down to his basement, put a cord around his neck and hung himself in his mansion. 1973, Doc Starcher, another partner in this, was arrested on tax evasion and he's deported to Israel, never to be seen again. Charles Haber, the drug beer guy, was convicted on a narcotics peddling charge at 53 and at age 60 and he was sent to prison for 10 years. Yeah, see, it's not all fun and games, is it?